Welcome to the Empowering Teaching Excellence Podcast, empowered by academic and instructional services at Utah State University. Welcome, I'm Erin Wadsworth-Anderson. And I'm Travis Thurston. And we're so pleased today to have Michelle Pekansky brock with us. Michelle, would you like to tell us what you do for the California Community College System? Absolutely. I work at the state level in California. We have 114 community colleges. And I work for a statewide initiative, the California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative. I work on the professional development arm of that initiative, uh, which is known as At One, the online network of educators. And we provide professional development to our entire state and really help um, the local colleges scaffold and provide more robust faculty development for their instructors that teach online. Well, awesome. We're so pleased to have you with us today. And we're going to be talking about um, one of your articles about um, motivation for online learners. Yeah, so one of the first things that we talk about when we are addressing motivating online students is creating the learning environment. Yeah, the, the learning environment is such a big part of motivation. It's, um, I find that oftentimes in working with faculty and even myself as an instructor, um, we have this assumption about motivation that it's just this kind of intrinsic um, element of a student that we expect the students to bring to the table and so when we you know put stuff out there design courses a certain way and students don't reciprocate or engage the way that we expect them to we put it back on the student and mm -hmm. think there's something wrong with them mm -hmm. where what we really need to be doing is looking at our own environments and considering how we could improve them a the students know that there's a human on the other side mm -hmm. it's a human who's there to support them who believes they can do it right so you've really got to start asking yourselves how do you construct that kind of presence online because if you don't intentionally do it when you're teaching online it doesn't happen it's not there it's not like the classroom mm -hmm. where we bring our presence in automatically absolutely and i think another part of that is that with kind of that comparison to a face-to-face -face classroom students have learned specific social norms you know if i walk into a lecture hall i know what kind of experience this is going to be i'm going to be sitting down and listening to someone if I sit down in a small class with a table and chairs around, that environment signals to the student that this is going to be maybe a little more interactive and I'm going to have more of a participation role. And so a, a phrase that Riggs and Linder use when we're creating our online environment, they call it a, an architecture of engagement. And it takes a lot of that intentionality, right? We have to really specifically think what types of expectations are we setting for our students? Um, how do we want them to interact? How can I let them know the types of interactions that they can expect from me as the instructor? Um, and all of that work up front to create that, as they say, that architecture of engagement. Right. Well, and you don't want to create anxiety for the student either. I feel as a student, I would go into an online class and if I saw nothing on the front page, no um, expectation of where I need to go, any kind of navigation, anything like that. I think that creates a lot of anxiety. So if you're giving your students, first of all, a nice um, opening landing page and they know exactly it's simple, they know where to go, they know what to do week by week, I think that that provides a great service for the students. And if you're not doing that and they don't know really what to expect, then that's, from the moment they hit the front page, it just falls flat. Absolutely. So you have to be able to engage them right from that first second. Because I, like I said, the nothing on the page can cause anxiety, but you're giving them a simple navigation and somewhere to go, that really is going to make them feel like they're in that architecture of engagement, that safer environment, so that they can engage and have that self-motivation. Mm -hmm. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of upfront work that goes into creating that environment in the first place. But a large part of it too is creating assignments and, and assessments that are really going to be uh, supportive of the student. Uh, when we're thinking about adult learning theory, it's gonna be something that's relevant to them. Uh, so we again build that motivation through intrinsically through providing experiences that are going to make sense to the student, something that they can apply. Um, and and you go through in this article a few of the ways that we can do that. So you call these the, the six C's of motivation. 
So the, the first is choice. And with choice, we can create options for increasing intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just want to point out that these aren't my 60s. They were taken from Paris and Turner. So just some give credit where credit is due. <laughs> um, but I do think it's interesting that we'll, it, just to make that connection that we're just we're really just talking about good teaching here um, and using a lot of principles from universal design for learning mm -hmm. as well uh, and culturally responsive teaching so those are two other kind of frameworks to think about that really play into these six C's at least in my eyes you know so when it comes to choice think about universal design for learning um, we it's based on something called learner variability and we know that human brains work in different ways. And um, when we can give our students a choice with something like an assessment, um, there was a fabulous blog post that I just read the other day that wasn't for an online class, but it was from um, um, CSU Channel Islands Teaching Learning Innovations. I'm going to give a shout out to my old team there. But it, oops, it was an instructor who um, who was thinking about, okay, so my student, my students need to master research skills, but why do they have to write an essay? Like, why does it have to be a paper? And so she had these really fabulous alternative assessment options. And I think that when we start there, when we peel back, like, just the, the way we've always done things and start asking our questions, why do, why do I do it this way? Why do I have to assess my students this way? Is there another way they can demonstrate these skills? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, for example, maybe start with, instead of writing this research paper, if the students still need to demonstrate research and mastery of knowledge over certain concepts, can they do that in another format? Like, can, can they create a website? Could they record a video, different mm -hmm. alternatives? And start there and, you know, think about them as just assessing the same skills, but in different ways. Um, give those students the options and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. That that gets to the idea um, in self-determination theory, we would call that being autonomy supportive, right? The, first of all, the intentionality of thinking, why am I giving this assignment? Is this really measuring what I need it to measure? But also thinking about the different choices and options that you can give to the students so that they can, they can provide or they can demonstrate their learning in a way that makes sense for them. Yeah, we actually have a class that we created here at Utah State, USU 1330. It's a creative arts course, and it's a large enrollment course that most freshmen, at least a few years ago, had to take. Um, now they have other choices, but <clears throat> in this USU 1330, we actually gave them four modules, and within all of those modules, there were five units, and they could choose three. Mm -hmm. And so there were 18 assignments, but they only had to turn in 12. So they got to choose, for example, we had an art module, which the units included a museum, avant-garde, photography, and things like that. And so they got to choose the three they wanted and do the assignments through that. And I feel like that gave them a really, it's a great opportunity to give them choice. Um, but I always felt like it seemed like a fun class that I wanted to take. Um, but so many of them participated in the discussions. They really enjoyed the discussions, especially those where they got to provide artifacts um, that they felt were relevant for the discussion. And I always love that when I'm telling a student, show me what you think um, embodies this, this feeling maybe that this, this photograph has. But the fact that they engaged in those more than others, I thought was really telling. And students can bring their own backgrounds and experience and stories into exactly. those conversations. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah authentic assessment, it mm -hmm. really does yeah. sparkle, spark motivation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that, that actually leads in nicely to uh, constructing meaning, uh, where we can empower students to discover real world connections. So. Uh, that, I feel like that gets to that idea of authentic assessments, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so constructing meaning, there's so many ways to do that in an online class. Um, I think, unfortunately, too often we see online classes be designed around a textbook. And if we take a step back and think about our, like, okay, so we're not in a classroom, which means our students have the world around them as their, their learning environment. So giving students opportunities to make simple connections. So you're learning about a concept in the course. I mean, 
how many times do you as an instructor, you know, see connections out in your real world, whether it's like, you know, an example of something in an architectural facade from a from an art history course or, um, you know, something in a field that demonstrates something you're learning about in biology. And but how many of your students have smartphones and could just take out a phone and document it with a picture or mm -hmm. interview another person that they know about a particular topic in course and mm -hmm. then bring that back into the course classroom. Anytime you can have the students make those real world connections, that is constructing meaning. And um, I think those opportunities really go a long way in terms of student motivation and we, we don't see enough of them in online classes. Absolutely. I think one of my, my favorite examples of this uh, was a class I taught a couple of years ago. And for the midterm, uh, for the online discussion, uh, they had all selected a topic from the course that they were going to be doing their final project on. But for the midterm, I wanted them to engage with some, some real world content that made sense to them. So I gave them some examples of like Twitter chats on topics that they could engage in, podcasts, different educational blogs, and I just told them to go out, find, find information from that topic that makes sense for your project, but then come back and share it with the rest of us. And, and by far, that, that discussion in that course was the one that had the most participation, both with initial posts from students, but then also the discourse that followed, mm -hmm. right? Where they're saying, wow, I, I had never thought of it that way, or I wouldn't have thought to go to a, a Twitter chat to, to connect with some of my peers. Yeah. yeah. I taught a, um, a history of women in art course, and it was based on a, a feminist methodology, and so we started with the word feminism, which, you know, students bring all kinds of assumptions and perceptions to the table about that word and what it means, but the first assignment was to just have a conversation with someone in your family from another generation about that word. Mm. And then, then we use that to start our conversations in the discussion. So um, yeah, breaking that ice and even, I mean, what a wonderful thing to have more you know, deep and meaningful conversations with family members about mm -hmm. a concept from a course. Yeah, and bring it to life. Absolutely. Okay, that leads us to our third item here in the six C's, uh, control. So the, the main idea here is give some of it up. <laughs> that can be scary. <laughs> yeah, that's a scary thing, but, but. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, uh, an experience that I've had with giving up some of that control was an online, an online class that I was teaching where the program in general, uh, they incorporated a lot of synchronous video Right, so they had synchronous meeting times, and I was trying to move away from that with this class. I wanted it to be more of an asynchronous online experience for the students. Um, but I sent out a midterm evaluation to kind of get some feedback from the students to see where I could improve, how I could uh, kind of remove some of the barriers to their learning. And several of the students said they wished that there were more synchronous meetings. And my initial reaction was, no, I, I'm, not, I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> but I, I, I took a step back. I thought, you know what, if, if that's what is going to help them, let's maybe see how this will work. So what I ended up doing is I reached out to two of the authors for the books that we were, uh, that we were reading for that class. And I set up uh, two different synchronous sessions where the students got to have kind of a Q&A with the author from the book. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was an amazing experience for me as the instructor and for the students as well that I never would have done it otherwise. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Giving up some control. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really important to ask the students what could make things better, especially as you're ongoing through the course. I think that creates a really good opportunity to um, uh, meet, you know, just kind of meet with the students, um, kind of see from their perspective what they're looking at. Because what, what we think we're teaching isn't necessarily what they're getting from our teaching. So I think it's really good to periodically ask how you're doing, should things be different, what can we do to improve, things like that. Absolutely. And 
Yeah, and I, I think sometimes there can be a fear of like, what am I going to learn? You know, well, I don't want to know. But <laughs> also, you could find things that are going really well that mm -hmm. you didn't really think were going so well. Mm -hmm. um, and then when just asking your students, that's another way to just let them know that you actually care. Right. I think mean, that's really what you're doing by sending out a survey like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to lead us to our fourth item here, which is challenge. So get students out of their comfort zones and encourage them to try new things. Yeah, so challenge. Um, you know, I think what's important to know is, well, to remember, to keep in mind, is that challenge means something different to everyone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, making that leap and trying something different was a challenge to your students. And it's human nature to want to stay in your comfort zone. It's human nature to do what, no, oh, this, this is what I know, this is what I'm good at, so this is what I'm going to do. But we also know that moving outside that comfort zone is, that's the sweet spot. That's when we really start to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. So I think contextualizing that for students, like having conversations with them about, you know, like, I am going to challenge you, and I do believe you can do this. So really keeping it really supportive, um, that's, that's something to remember about challenge. But... I, I, I've used a lot of, um, of, conver of voice and video discussions, asynchronous, using voice thread in the classes that I've taught. That's a huge challenge for students. And you know what? It's a huge challenge for instructors, too, because they don't want to see themselves. They don't want to hear themselves. We, I have identified that a lot of students have so much uh, reservation about the way they sound. They have mm. accents, mm. and so in an online class, they don't want to reveal that. They, sure. They're afraid of being judged, yeah. and so that's where that, that climate and being in it with the students and rec recognizing, you know, this was, this was hard for me too, and you know what? You're going to grow, instilling that growth mindset. Um, so the, the challenge is important, but I think all those other contextual elements are really important to remember when considering challenge, yeah. I think it's also, that's where the intentionality comes from um, and noticing that each of your students are going to be at a different level. One thing that I really liked, yeah. I, I took a class that Travis taught, it was actually my first online class, um, and it was an internet development class, HTML, and Travis actually noticed that there were students at a higher level than some others with their HTML experience. And so he actually had a, a mentor program or a tutoring program where he'd say, okay, those of you who are better at this, how about we pair you up with some that aren't as good and then you can work together. So noticing that everybody's going to be at a different level and that challenge should be different for some students and that's where that intentionality of creating your assessment comes from and saying, you know, maybe I need it to be at this level for this person, this level for this person, then kind of finding some middle ground in that. So noticing that that challenge is going to be different for everyone. And I like that you said knowing your students, because again, yeah. when you teach online, it's so easy to not even make an effort to know your students as more than just names on a screen. Mm -hmm. So what are the stories of your students and how are you going to be sure that you capture those at the start of the course so you can consider them moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, one thing we do as instructional designers when we meet with a faculty member is we ask them to look at the demographic of their course. Who's coming to your course? Who's going to be a part of it? Is it graduate level, undergraduate? All these things. And so being aware of who your students are in your classroom and um, helping that make, uh, you know, inform your decisions as you move forward is important. I like that. So that, that leads in actually nicely to this fifth item, which is collaboration, right? Where we want to empower our students to inspire one another. Yeah, and one of the great uh, initiatives that our academic, well, our academic initiatives um, director for our art museum on campus does is she really loves the idea of collaboration. And so she'll not only use the art museum for students to come and contemplate and use um, in their classes, whether they're art students or engineering students, math students, it's across the board. She, she has initiatives for, for utilizing the art museum no matter um, what class you're coming from. But she also encourages art classes and engineering classes to work together. And she's found several opportunities to utilize this um, initiative that she's come up with. And I think that's an amazing way to look at things from different points of view. Even if you're working on the same assignment, you're going to get different perspectives from the different students in, in each of your classes. So I really like that. I do. I, 
One for me as well that has been helpful for, for me as a professional, but that I've also shared with some of my students is the, the community that we can access using social media platforms like Twitter. Mm -hmm. right? There are so many people, specifically from the education world, other instructors that are trying to figure things out, trying to get ideas from others, sharing their own ideas that, that we can all gain from. Well, what's so great about our community is that we all have different backgrounds. So, you know, from education, from my background is in print journalism. I mean, so many different backgrounds. So we're coming at it from, from different points of view. And I think letting our students know what resources are out there, that the people sitting mm -hmm. next to you could be just such an amazing resource. And that's why in, the in some of the classes that I teach, I like to bring in a lot of guest speakers that are just on campus people that we know, people, you know, because I think so many students can feel so isolated, especially at a distance, and just noticing that even the person, you know, and, and using social media and things like that, the person next to you, you know, on yeah. Twitter or something like that could be the expert, right. could know and have great ideas. And so that's why collaboration is so important. Using social media for social good and education. Yes. <laughs> Thumbs up to that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, and that brings us to our final item here with the six C's, which is consequences. So unlocking learning from the walled garden of your LMS is a powerful way to improve ownership and accountability. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, I'll take that one. Yeah, I think it actually kind of loops back to some examples that we've already given, but I, I'm forgetting the name of the woman who I'm about to tell the story about. Um, I can't remember her name. But I heard her speak years ago, and she was talking, this was a long time ago, more than 10 years ago, but she was talking about using blogs in her course. This is for a face-to-face -face course, but it gives, it's a good example. And um, her student came to her um, office hour to turn in um, a paper, an assignment, and she looked at her student and said, oh, you, you, you must have misunderstood. That assignment actually needs to go on your blog, so why don't you just go ahead and, and, and post it to the blog and you'll be done. And the student looked at her and said, oh, well, then I need to rewrite this, you know, because when you're writing for an instructor, <laughs> it's, it's okay, but when you're writing for all of your peers or when you're writing on a blog that's going to be fully public or putting something on Twitter, or it changes the consequences, mm -hmm. right? It holds you more accountable. Um, and so I think that's really powerful. And um, going back to that, that motivational aspect and challenge, mm -hmm. going outside your comfort zone. And also, I mean, let's face it, we're educating students for the Google era. And if everything that they're doing is inside a learning management system, you know, are we really positioning them for success after graduation? Yeah. That's a great point. I, I really like, I usually push Twitter with my, with my yeah. students because it's a, an easy platform to share ideas and you can link to so many other things. So if, you ha if you're having your students uh, creating their own blog, or creating their own website or things, that's a place where they can share that. And this might be a little bit um, out in left field, but when you have students who don't feel like they're technologically savvy, or, um, you know, because we deal with so many non traditional students, mm -hmm. how do you sell that to them? <laughs> to use Twitter or use social media? I have a story about that. Yeah, I just actually wrote about it in my, I think, in my book. Um, I had a student named Diane, and my students were blogging. They were also using VoiceThread, and uh, it was a history photography course. And she wrote to me at the beginning of the course, and I do a survey. I, at the start of my courses, I did a survey, and I, she identified herself as who, someone who was really overwhelmed. And so I was kind of, you know, she was on my radar. So I reached out, and she came right back, and she's like, I don't want to do all this technology stuff. I'm in my 50s. This isn't in my wheelhouse. I'm not interested in going there. And I said, you know what, this is why we're doing this. And I, you know, we had a conversation about community and a lot of these elements that we're talking about here. And I said, you can do this. I trust me, you can do this. I'm not asking you to do anything that you cannot do and I'm here for you every step of the way. And that conversation was enough to get her to stick with the course. And I said, take it day by day and let's check in a week from now. And all I did was check in 
I didn't have to give her any support. She she did just fine. And at the end of the course, um, you know, first of all, she reflected on how all the support I gave her, which I didn't give her a lot of support. <laughs> and she wrote to me and she said, I want you to know that I just got a job for a local newspaper writing blog posts for them. <laughs> And I was like, Amazing. oh my gosh, you know, so she not only mastered it, but she turned around and saw the connection to what she was doing mm -hmm. and actually wrote to this newspaper and asked if she could be hired to write these blog posts and she got <laughs> hired. So there. I love that. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I think that touches on an important note too, um, mm -hmm. on what, what Riggs and Linder call inhabiting the architecture, right? It's that, that social presence aspect that we have to take on as instructors. We're creating this environment, this learning environment. We're creating these assignments and assessments, but we need to be present as well. Mm -hmm. We need to know who our students are, reach out to them, and scaffold and help them along the way. Yeah, and just that little, I believe you can do this, that goes a long way. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And now you're getting into my whole humanizing um, <laughs> topic, which is very near and dear to my heart. So, yeah, and it's something that we do with our faculty across the system because we don't have resources like you have here at Utah State uh, University. I mean, the resources here are phenomenal. Be very fortunate. You're very fortunate. <laughs> Be very grateful for them. Um, but, you know, we just we have our faculty take out their smartphone and start recording video, like mm -hmm. one minute videos and uploading them to YouTube, editing the captioning and embedding them in Canvas. And just that workflow, all of a sudden they feel so empowered because mm -hmm. they, they know what YouTube, like how to use YouTube for, for their own purposes. Um, but the power of a one minute video that actually yeah. is connected to what's mm -hmm. happening in the course yeah. and referencing what's going on and including that in an announcement, um, you know, that goes a long way. And so it doesn't have to be something really high end. There's mm -hmm. a lot of nitty gritty stuff that you can do and <laughs> yeah. use that it's works true. really well. Yeah. I, I really love that idea of humanizing that environment, mm -hmm. right? Especially with our, our online courses where it can feel very impersonal to to help our students feel that human element and connection. Yeah, it has to be intentional. Yeah. yeah. And it might take a lot of work up front, but I feel it's worth it. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, o over time you do it. You don't do it all. You know, maybe you're going right. to do like, you know, a little bit this semester and then you can add on to it. And, and those, those one minute videos that I mentioned, yeah, those are videos that don't get repurposed, mm -hmm. but then there are videos that do get repurposed. So there's, mm -hmm. there's different layers to it. Yeah. Yeah. When I work with faculty members, I like to refer to their course as a kind of a living organism. It's not something that's just going, we're going to make it and it's just there. You've constantly got to be working on it and changing it. And that's why sometimes we get these stagnant courses that need to be redeveloped. It needs to be something that you're constantly working on and constantly changing so that it moves with your students and, and they can see that intentionality behind it. Yeah, I like that. I love that. Living organism. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was thank great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for our ETE podcast. Be sure to join us on Twitter at Empower Teaching, on Facebook at facebook.com slash empowerteaching, and at empowerteaching.usu.edu.